But we'll go ahead and uh, start start again. And uh, we have uh, some outstanding uh, speakers uh, for this next session. The first is uh, Guido Gehrig from University of Utah, who will talk to us about modeling brain injury and trajectory of brain changes from longitudinal multimodal imaging. Guido. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so we already heard the title, so thank you very much, uh, Mike, for inviting us. So this is a joint collaborative work between the University of Utah then UCLA, Lonnie Lab with Jack Van Horn, uh, Andre Iremia, our TOGAS group, and also Dr. David Hofta and Paul Vespa of the TBI clinic at UCLA. And also the NAMIC research team with PI Ron Kikinis at Harvard Brigham and Women's uh, Medical School. Okay, so basically I don't have to tell you why we do that because we heard that all morning. But the main goal of our research in image processing methodologies is here. We would like to know how does the brain change due to rehabilitation. So first change would be, yes, there are damages to the brain, so that's different from controls, but also kind of the change of neuroanatomy and function during the time when you also assess the clinical symptoms. Secondly, what we see, there is really no automated analysis for that. So you will see what we aim for in the next slides. First of all, I was happy to see this morning uh, with Dr. Mass's talk that we go for multimodal imaging. And I will add later the DTI, diffusion medical images. You see, we use, in a standard way, five different modalities. And you also see they help us to identify lesions because we would like to characterize uh, location and uh, the type of lesions, extent type, focal, multifocal lesions for single time points. But now we also have multiple time points. We heard that this morning. So acute after several weeks, three months, six months, 12 months. So we have follow-up data. So we have multimodal follow-up data to characterize different type of lesions at the acute and chronic stage. So that somehow sets up the stage because we claim there's really no software package up there that can do that in a highly automated way. So first of all, some challenges that we face. This, we have a huge heterogeneity in TBI. We have seen this beautiful slide from Dr. Lipton with his two cars crashing, asking the question, do the lesions show up in the same regions or are the regions vulnerable? Uh, so we deal with that. So this is a big problem for image processing. Secondly, we have large-scale deformations and also large-scale changes over time due to rehabilitation. So both. And for those involved in registration, topology changes or appearing, disappearing lesions are a big, big problem. Usually they're not part of our packages, neither free software nor first. They cannot deal with that because usually we, we assume a diffeomorphic registration one-to-one. -one. Okay, so first challenge, large-scale deformations. You surely have seen such images before due to the impact. Second, these time changes of lesions which appear differently in different modalities but also show different changes over time. So that's the multimodal longitudinal change. And third, appearance changes in MRI. So there is appearance that is not really modeled by a standardized atlas, because there are lesions that appear and disappear. And also we have infiltration versus mass effect. OK, so we started a project uh, many years ago in collaboration with UCLA and uh, NAMIC. This 40 pulsar pathological anatomy regression via segmentation and registration. And just to walk you through quickly, we rely on normal anatomy, normative databases that we have, a normative brain atlas that gives you a parcellation, but also probability maps for tissue. Now, a patient definitely looks different, especially in severe TBI. You see here we have patient data at different time points. I show here only the T2. Now we start to develop a scheme that does a subject-specific modeling of tissue and lesions. 
lesion changes over time. So we get probability maps for white matter here, gray matter, CSF, but also probability maps for lesions, and that's the key. And also what we do is we map this subject-specific data back to the normative data. So we provide a mapping to a normative atlas, and that goes back to what Dr. Lipton's talked about. Individualized versus group-wise processing. So group-wise would be we map everything to the atlas, but it's not that easy because you have to know about these lesions. So I don't want to go into details here, but mostly the key part is we separate the images automatically into a diffeomorphic and a non-diffeomorphic part because we have to account for lesions that appear and disappear that create topology changes, whereas we also have probability maps for parts or uh, tissues that can be diffeomorphically registered. Okay, so this is one result, just taking a few cases in collaboration with UCLA. Uh, time one, time two, where you see a disappearing lesion here in the uh, left temporal lobe regions, or, and then a new diffusive lesion showing up at time two and our automatic segmentation and the blending. So that shows we can co-register this data and model the time course. So we have volumetric data. So if you do this analysis, we get volumes of lesions. We get volumes of normal tissue categories, hemorrhagic, non-hemorrhagic lesions, CSF, white gray matter. This shows kind of the quantitative analysis that we get time one, time two. Or if you have more time points, we have serial data results uh, for the whole time series. Uh, this, now, this whole system allows us also to map the parcellation to the patient, because that's a typical issue. If you do free surfer analysis, they cannot handle lesions or large lesions. So through our mapping, because we know about the lesion deformations, we can do that. We can measure deformations, we measure cortical thickness, changes of cortical thickness over time, and come up with a comprehensive set of measurements for characterizing time change. We did a correlation with clinical scores, as mentioned before, the Glasgow uh, Coma score and the outcome score at acute and chronic. This is, we have to take that with caution. So we are engineers. We did that on a very small database, so don't trust too much these values, but it's more an attempt to go towards a correlation of clinical outcome scores with image-derived measures. You see a set of measurements like surface-based, volume-based features, and then the different low-bar subdivisions that we get. So, okay, a key important uh, component of the system is this parcellation mapped to the individual patients as you see here for the time point, time one, and time two. And we will hear later in the talk by Andre Rimia from UCLA, this allows us to do this connectomics visualization, because you can only do that if you have a parcellation, if you know the connectivity, but the connectivity in the presence of lesions, disappearing and appearing lesions. So let's quickly come to DTI. This framework allows us to um, automatically integrate diffusion tensor imaging into the same framework because we do multi-modal image registration in the, for each time point, but also across time. So just a heads up, we also model the DTI changes over time. So if you have uh, FA, fractional anastomy measurements in different regions, here the Sumo Moris Atlas regions that we used, at different time points. This is not a TBI example. This is an infant at different time points, but the same technology you will see will apply to TBI. We get discrete time point data, FA in different regions at different times. We model a continuous trajectory by nonlinear mixed effect modeling and a parametric model, and we get so-called atlas data. So we, we can now get normative data of FA for specific subjects. We can extend these concepts to tractography. We have seen tracts before. We do a parameterization of the tract along arc length from one end to the other one. So you map them in a coordinate frame and also calculate diffusivity measures along tracts. Then we do the modeling over time. So this is fractional anisotropy along the tract at different time points. So it just lay out the framework. We model the time changes 
by a parametric modeling and get the normative data. So this is kind of how we construct the normative atlases. Applied to a study, still not TBI, because this is work in progress that we will all be applied to TBI patient data. This is a, a, an example from Huntington's disease. You see control data, so regression over time. Age, 42 to 50. This is a long track, and this is FA. So we get a spatiotemporal model, a long track, over time, here for a Huntington disease patient with a decrease of FA over time and control data. So this is kind of the framework that we have in mind to give the data out to clinicians. So quick, uh, this is what we calculated last week in collaboration with UCLA. Sorry. Uh, we have uh, structural image data, we have DTI data at different time points. First step is co-registration of DTI to T2 at different time points. And since we have also the spatiotemporal model of the structural data, also knowing about lesions, we can co-register the DTI. This is a color overlay, so it's a little bit confusing. We can co-register DTI even in the presence of large lesion changes one-to-one. -one. So this is an overlay of DTI at the different time points. Then we do tractography analysis, as we heard before, for acute and chronic. We see significant changes because there is a huge lesion load in this patient. And then overlay the longitudinal changes of lesions. Here, acute versus chronic lesions and the fiber tracts. So this is now a joint visualization of the time change of lesions and the fiber tracts in the anatomy of the individual brain, and also tract specific analysis. So this is the, the tract, a long tract. This is the statistics of FA for acute is red and uh, chronic is blue, where you get the long tract, very different sections of the tract. So we try to localize parts of the tract that show typical differences. So it's kind of not using only the mean FA along a track. You see the FA changes considerably along tracks, but uh, track-specific analysis where we get out data which you can use for statistical analysis. So the framework is integrated into Slicer. 3D Slicer is the product of the NAMIC team, the large effort centered around the Ron Kikinesis group at Harvard Medical School. Uh, the slicer, yeah, you may know about it. It's an open source package, freely available, plugin capabilities, has BCS-style uh, open source licenses, and it's a community effort. Everybody can jump on, integrate their tools, use them, change them, so it's open source. We work with Kitware on that. <coughs> it has a large set for diffusion imaging, and there are tutorials for all the tools, starting from DICOM to tractography to statistical analysis. So especially if you go to this uh, NAMIC website, we have regularly the SPIE workshops where we give one-day tutorials on how to use the software from beginning to the end with a hands-on session. <coughs> so tools integrated are DICOM, DTI registration, Atlas building for normative atlases, uh, from the DWI to fiber tracts, so creating the diffusivity measures like fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity axial, uh, and so on. Different type of tractography depending on the data, even for high angular diffusion uh, images, uh, fiber processing, as you have seen before, along fiber tract analysis scientific visualization and validation. Okay, so I come to the conclusion. This is an effort about the software framework. This is more our computer science part for integrated analysis of multimodal MRI, DTI, over time. So we have this spatiotemporal data that we get from the new initiatives that you heard this morning, a 4D segmentation tool, we explicitly model lesions and tissue. That's one of the keys. We cannot co-register data if you don't know about the lesions and vice versa. It's like a chicken and egg problem. So we have to model 
lesions, infiltrations to come up with a suitable high precision registration for the data. Tools are integrated into 3D Slicer as open source uh, package, as I told you. And the websites also include, in the spirit of this meeting, access to test data sets that we get from the UCLA partner groups. So with that, I would like to acknowledge uh, our grant uh, supporting our research, the USTAR team at the University of Utah, and my research group. Thank you very much.